Cool. Hello, everyone. Uh, hopefully, everyone can hear me OK. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, it's my first time in Romania. Uh, I've, too, been practicing. Um, so I got it right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. So my name's Jack. Uh, I'm a developer uh, based in London. That's me on the internet, on Twitter. That's where you can find me. Uh, I work for a company called Pusher. Who's heard of Pusher? Good. Not many of you. Excellent. Uh, so Pusher is like a, a hosted real-time messaging platform. Uh, we make it really easy to add like real-time features to your website or application or mobile apps. Uh, if any of that's of interest, please come and uh, talk to me. But I'm not going to talk about Pusher. Uh, I'm here to talk about Elm. Uh, so before I talk about Elm, I want to talk about JavaScript. This slide is also bright yellow just to uh, wake you up a little bit. Uh, um, I want to talk a bit about the great tooling problem uh, of 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19, uh, and so on. As we started build, putting more and more logic into the client rather than onto the uh, server, we've reached this point where JavaScript applications have become more tricky to build. And there's this general sense that actually our tools aren't always helping us and that we should have way easier tools. And whilst I agree up to a point, I think there also comes a point where we, we should accept that complicated applications are actually hard to build. And that's a fact of software development and a fact of life. There is never going to be a tool or language that will make them absolutely easy and effortless to put together these large, complicated applications. And instead, we should be looking for tools that make it simpler or more enjoyable or more productive to put these applications together. And regardless of uh, my personal thoughts on, on Angular and Angular 2, I think Tim showed that as well. Angular 2 isn't something that you're going to put into your, your app and make it a complete you know, effortless um, thing to build this big app or an app where my face gets crushed by a rock thrown by a bear. But hopefully, we can look at tools that make things slightly easier or slightly more simple uh, and, and more to the point, enjoyable. If we all have to um, work on these for, oh, we all have to, uh, thank you. We all have to work on these applications for eight hours a day, five days a week. We want to enjoy our, our work and enjoy writing code. So if we look at some of the trends in com complex, excuse me, JavaScript applications from kind of back when they first started to now, and we've kind of seen a complete reversal in, in the thought process here. We started with two-way data binding. This is the Angular ones of the world, uh, the Knockout, JSs, uh, and many others that had this idea that you had some data in JavaScript, you referenced it in a template, and then a ton of stuff happened behind the scenes to keep those two in sync for you. This was so popular, there was even a proposal to add something to the native language, uh, object or observe, to make this much easier and more efficient for frameworks. Uh, this has since been dropped from the uh, proposal, so this will not be making it into uh, JavaScript. I think it even got to the point where Chrome implemented this. Uh, I don't know if they've removed their implementation, but this is no longer uh, a feature that will happen. And then we did the MVCs and the MVVCs and the MCVC, VM, MCV, CCCs. And, and we, <laughs> by the way, I actually did that properly. Like, um, and, and really, this was all a thought process of let's replicate Rails, I think. So Rails was, um, and still is, a very good server-side choice. It's a very large Ruby framework that is a very traditional MVC-structured application. In Rails, you have your models, you have your views, and you have your controllers, which is where most of the logic lives. But I think what people realized is that actually, we can do better. Rails and that style of approach works great for server-sides, but it doesn't always work best on the browser. There's a lot more stuff going on in the browser. You typically have to deal with user interaction from many different sources, and there's just a ton more that can change at, at any point in time. And really, this, this MVC architecture didn't really fit. What's happened over the last year or so, and this is something Tim also touched on, is we've really gone towards this component-based approach. And I'd say that this definitely started with, with React uh, and the way we can nest components and compose components together really straightforwardly. But what's really cool is, is React kind of introduced this and made it pretty popular. But we've seen Angular 2, as we just saw. Tim has done a lot of work for me for this talk, um, which is excellent. Uh, Ember has gone down the, the components route as well. I think in Ember 2, they deprecated controllers and suggested everyone move towards components. Uh, there's Vue.js, which is also very component heavy, and React as well. So this component architecture, people have found, works much better for the web. And I think it's a direction we're heading in, and it's a direction we all feel very uh, confident in, particularly with native web components happening at some point. And what's also interesting to me is, who actually likes JavaScript? It's like half, uh, yeah, some of you are just lazy. But that's like, 
half the room uh, at a JavaScript conference. No one seems to be writing plain JavaScript anymore, which is interesting to me. And I'm one of these people who, who often doesn't. Whether that's even running JavaScript through something like Babel um, to get latest features, you're technically not writing you know, standard native supported JavaScript in a lot of cases there. Whether that's an Angular 2 TypeScript, uh, whatever it is, it doesn't seem like many people like JavaScript, which is uh, kind of interesting. So we're seeing a lot of, a lot of um, libraries add these layers that need to be transpiled or converted back into regular JavaScript. And then at that point, you start to wonder, well, if we're all not writing JavaScript anyway, why couldn't we can create a language that makes this much easier? And as you'll see, that's the kind of point of me being on stage, is to talk uh, a little bit about Elm. But first, just a few more kind of observations about, about applications uh, these days. People have started being way more explicit about state. Once we moved past the two-way data binding, where you had data all over the place and no one had any idea where it was, we realized that actually, if you can keep your state in one place and have a single source of truth for your application's data, things become much easier to work with. They're easier to debug. They're easier to keep track of. It's easier to replicate a bug that a user has, because you can take their data and put it into your application. I'll try and tweet a link, but there's an amazing uh, video of this. Has anyone used CircleCI? Travis type thing, build thing, a few people. So it's just like Travis, it will run your tests when you push to GitHub or, or whatever. And they built their app in ClojureScript, uh, but they represent all their state at the very top le level as a big object. And when a user reports a bug, they can take all the data from that user's browser and take that state and fire it up locally on their machines and immediately get the application in the same state the user saw it when they had the bug, which is it's amazing and a really nice experience. Once you have this state as well, we can start thinking that views represent state. So my view function becomes a function that takes some state and calls some HTML. And this again is, is really something that React popularized with the idea that views um, can return virtual HTML or virtual DOM, and then we can very efficiently figure out what we need to update in the browser to keep the two in sync. Once you can do this efficiently, it no longer becomes required. Um, or sorry, once you can do that efficiently, it's fine to just call view over and over again as the state changes because you can trust the library to really efficiently edit the actual HTML. And view functions are pure as well. So if I call view with the same state, I'll get the same resulting HTML. Here, a pure function means that all, its, all, everything, all the data that it requires are given to it as inputs. It doesn't rely on any global state or data. This means that nothing outside of the function can ever edit its behavior or change its output. So we started to have this, and then we thought, well, the next big complicated thing is dealing with user actions. I think there's one particular library that has made this idea popular, and that's Redux, which is a, a, a library that is added to React often, but can be used with others to really model state and user input. So now we start to very explicitly model every action that a user can possibly do that will edit our state as, as objects. And this is, this is uh, from Redux. But as you see, it's just plain JavaScript, and we just have this action with a type called user add to do, then any additional metadata we need to create this to do. And then suddenly we have a very explicit list of everything a user can do that might change our application. From there, we can start looking at how we update our state, and we define an update function. And this takes in some action, which is like add to do, and then the current state of our application, and it produces the new state. What's key here is that this is pure as well. If I call update with the same stuff twice, I'll get back the exact same result. All of these changes, all of these kind of functions that we're defining or, or using make it much easier to debug things. Once we have pure functions and we don't have the two-way data binding, things are way easier to work with, they're easier to test, and they're less prone to, to being buggy. What's really interesting is that update will encapsulate most of your business logic as well. So suddenly, all your, all your logic ends up in a function that looks somewhat like this. This means you don't have lots of little bits of logic scattered around all your different components and different files. You have them outside of your user interface in a function or functions. You can Obviously, you wouldn't have one huge one. You can split this up. That is much easier to test. And then we start getting into, again, another thing that React with kind of flux, uh, that kind of architecture became uh, more apparent, is this unidirectional data flow. So the user clicks. That sends an action, that sends an update, uh, and then the view renders the HTML. You think of this in a, in a diagram, and I apologize, because my, my diagram skills are pretty low on the, on the scale. Um, look at that. I picked the default blue and red from Keynote, uh, and I really ran with it. Uh, so we, you know, we have all our components, and data flows down the components, and the updates go back up to the top. 
At no point, none of these arrows are, are bi-directional. They're all just going one way. Again, this makes things much easier to, to work with. Something that's quite tricky on the client side, and always has been and always will be, is dealing with, with side effects. This is something, for example, that means a Rails-type architecture is often not so suited to the client side, because we have a bunch more asynchronous stuff that will happen. The most obvious being some form of uh, HTTP request to fetch some data from, from some form of, of API. And async actions make things harder to work with. Maybe a user clicks on a load button that goes off to some API. So then we update first with some action, then we view again, then that async action at some point is going to pop back in and say, hey, I've got some data, then we have to do it all over again. And suddenly this is now a little bit more tricky uh, to debug because we've got these async actions that are going to return to us at some point, but we don't know when. What's much more uh, enjoyable and easier to work with is if we explicitly model these side effects. What that means is our update function changes a little to return to take still an action in a state, but return not only the new state, but an optional command. This is something that will be the, the platform, Elm in, in my case, obviously, but whatever it is, will take and then run in the background for you and return at some point later on. So now the user clicks, and the update function can return the new state, but also a command, command A. We'll then run that in the background as we render. When that pops back, we'll then run the update again. This time, it doesn't need to return a command. So now we've made it very easy and explicit to see where asynchronous commands are happening in our application, because they have to be returned by our update function. And our update function now becomes the almost single source of truth for all our business logic and, and how things work and how user actions are dealt with. What's really interesting is we've, we've also seen this kind of explicit versus magic debate. And I think we started very magic. I would argue that things like Angular 1, everyone's favorite, um, and Knockout and, and the like were quite magic in the way they kept data in sync uh, and all the features they provided. Then we've seen Angular 2 is, is very explicit. React, I find, pretty explicit. Elm is, uh, and so on. Something like this is pretty magical. I call set new user, I dump something on the scope, and then magically that's going to be kept in sync throughout my application uh, without me having to worry about it. Which, by the way, is absolutely fine until it doesn't work uh, and there's a bug, and then it's a real pain. Again, being kind of, uh, this is a Redux code example. Um, Redux makes you be explicit. So here's your update function with your action and your state, and then we switch on the type of the action. In the case it's a new user, we, uh, we dump some information onto the state. This is way more explicit. There's no mutation here, uh, and it's much clearer for me. If, if I'm a developer and something's wrong with the login, I can go to this and, and see my logic there. And then, and then this is your first bit of Elm, by the way. We could get even more explicit if we could model these as types. Uh, I'm really pleased that Tim touched upon types, because it makes my job a little easier as well. So in Elm, we can define these types. So we say, right, message here, which is all the messages a user could ever create in our system. That's like logging in, deleting data, adding data, and so on. Well, it can either be a new user with some name that is a type string, or it could be a logout. And then in your update function, we have this case statement, which is the same as a kind of switch case in, in JavaScript. But the compiler can spot that the case statement isn't exhaustive, that I haven't dealt with every possible message the user might uh, take. So just down the bottom left, you can see it says, you need to account for the following values log out. This is amazing. Um, this is one of the things that really brought me to Elm and made me think, well, oh, this, this seems like a pretty cool idea. Because suddenly your compiler is checking for you that you haven't done anything stupid, basically. And I do a lot of stupid things. So Elm. So Elm takes the approach of, right, we have all these problems or things we find difficult in building applications on the web. And rather than try and solve it by building a library, like a React and then a Redux and all those things, or an Ember or an Angular, rather than do that, what happens if we built a language from scratch to do it and we'll compile it into JavaScript? And that's effectively uh, what Elm is. It's a language to, to try and solve some of these problems. It actually turns out we've known about this for ages. Um, Sherlock knew about it in that often quoted um, thing he always says. Which, by the way, from researching for this slide, A, it's a dreadful joke, I'm really sorry. But B, he never actually said Elemental, my dear Watson. So it's, it's an entire misquote, something he never actually said. But still, the joke's hilarious. I think we'll all agree. And it's important to note as well that Elm isn't the finished article. I'm not here to talk about Elm as the thing you should use right now to build all your applications because it's great and has no issues. It's definitely not. It's still relatively young. I think it's got a long way to go. But I think it's definitely showing enough potential and showing enough usage at the moment to make it something that we should all consider. 
It's not the perfect language yet. Uh, I don't think there ever will be a perfect language, but I think it's, it's got a lot of things that I hope will uh, appeal to you. And a lot of its ideas as well are useful even if you don't end up writing Elm after this talk. I'm not expecting you all to go back to your, your jobs uh, tomorrow and rewrite your applications in Elm. Um, but hopefully some of the ideas that I'll present and that Elm provides might be of use as you're building your next, uh, your next JavaScript thing. And I just added this slide because of the question about debugging Angular. Um, but Elm has this quite ambitious goal of having no runtime errors ever in your application. This sounds kind of ludicrous, but actually, when you get working with Elm and you see how great the compiler is at spotting flaws, this, this is achievable. There's a company in San Francisco called No Red Ink, and they build, uh, they build tech for uh, school kids and help them learn, help them improve their English, like a web app where they drag, they drag words in and, and they learn grammar and, and so on. They've been running Elm in production for, I don't know, a good long time, months slash years, and they've never had a single runtime error because the compiler is so good at checking every possibility where something could go wrong that it just can't happen in the browser. This is really, really cool. And if you look online or if you read a blog post or if you watch any previous talks, um, often Elm is described as functional, typed, and compiled. That's fine. That's a bit comp sci and boring for my liking. Um, so I go for expressive, self-documenting, and robust, which are all good buzzwords as well for the GitHub page. Uh, I don't want to kind of fool you. Uh, I'm not going to lie to you. There is a little bit of a learning curve. Elm is very different, as we'll start to see in a minute, to JavaScript. Uh, for anyone who's done a bunch of functional programming or touched on languages like Haskell or even Clojure slash ClojureScript, it'd probably be a bit more straightforward for you to pick up. But I would encourage you to stick with it. The syntax does become um, really nice, but there is a little bit of a, a curve at the beginning. So the first is the expressive, um, clear code side of Elm. Um, the first part of that is just the fact that it is a functional language. So whereas in JavaScript, we'd have add, and we call it with, with one and two, like that, as parens. Here, we just in Elm, we can ditch the, uh, ditch the commas, and we just call add space one space two. We can do really cool things. Um, just to give you a flavor, we can map over a list. Uh, the top example creates an anonymous function, much like in JavaScript, that returns the thing with two added. But then we can also do partial application. So here I take the plus method. Oh, that's not going to work, is it? I take the plus method and partially apply it. So I call it once with two, and then I get a function that will always add two to whatever it's given. So once you get comfortable with this, you can start to write real, real concise but still very clear code. One of my favorite features of the language from a pure syntax point of view is pipes. There's actually a proposal for something along these lines to make it into JavaScript, although I think we're a way off that happening. But rather than have these deep nested functions where you have to read them from inside out, so I first call make person with Jack, then I increment my age, then I increment my height, and then I increment my weight, which is the one I have to do most often at the moment, which is disappointing. Uh, instead of doing that, I can rewrite it as the version below. So we, we take whatever make person Jack returns, we send it through increment age, whatever that returns is passed into increment height, and so on and so forth. This leads to really, really readable kind of self-documenting uh, code. And I personally just find the syntax at Elm very, very clear and, and a pleasure to work with. This top one is defining a function called increment age, which takes a person, which is a record, which is akin to a JavaScript object literal. And here I take that person and I update the age field in it to be the person's age uh, plus one. Defining functions, there's no kind of braces, there's no brackets, there's no commas, there's no semicolons, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, it's just quite nice. Once you get used to this, I think you'll find it a pleasure to work with. And I touched upon it being self-documenting. One of the main reasons that it is self-documenting uh, is because of types. As a wise man once said, uh, dynamic languages are a foolish friend. I don't know who did that. Um, but, but adding types to language makes it incredibly uh, self-documenting and very clear and, and easy to understand. I mean, Tim made me a, like, a man that gets crushed by a bear, and I gave him love hearts, but what can you do? Um, so now we have types, um, we have kind of built-in types, so we can, we can annotate functions with these types. So here I've got add function, and you can read this as it takes an integer and another integer and returns an integer. So the most right-hand type is the return type, everything else is the type of each subsequent argument. So is even, for example, takes an integer and returns a boolean. It took me a while to get used to reading these. And in L, when you define functions, it's actually entirely optional that you add type annotations to them. 
If not, the compiler can infer the types. But I'd highly recommend getting used to these type annotations and using them at all times. You'll thank yourself when you come back to some code you haven't worked on in a couple of months. Where the type system really begins to shine in, in Elm is when we can start defining our own types. The first type is called a union type. Uh, Tim showed an example of this as well, but we've got this type filter, which can be one of this show all type, or show completed, or show active. Then I can write a function called show to do's, which can take in a filter and a list of to do's and return a new list of to do's. And then I can, I can do a case, a match on the type of filter. If it's show all, I'll return every single to do. If it's show completed, I'll filter the list for the to do's that are complete. And then show active, I'll filter the list for the to do's that are not complete. I think this is really clear, it's really nice, and there's a few um, nicer side effects as well. They'll be checked by the compiler, because the compiler checks types, along with many other things. So if I typo one of those types, or I forget to deal with one, the compiler's got my back, and it will tell me so. And it's easy to change or add a new one, or you know, um, rename one, or so on, because I'll do it, and then I'll just fix every compiler error. I'll rename it in one place, I'll get an error somewhere else, I'll rename it there, and the compiler will just walk me through all the steps I need to take to fix my application. Uh, just a note as well, because we'll need this later on, Elm also has the idea of type variables. So this is when, I, I would call this placeholders. This is when you don't know exactly what the type is going to be, but you know that you need the function to return the same type. So some func here takes a type A and a type B and returns a type A, which is basically saying the A's have to match as the, and the B can be any type. So the A's can be any type as long as they're the same, and the B can be any type as well. So all these um, lower kind of type annotations would be, would be valid. Just kind of store that in the back of your head uh, for later on. The most cool thing, though, about Elm's type system is the type aliases. So here, if, I've got, if I'm passing around objects or records, as I would call them in Elm, I've got a person which always has a name, which is a string, and an age, which is an int. Uh, I can define a type alias for that. So I can say, when you tell the compiler, when you see person, what you're actually looking for is a, is a record with these keys that are these types. Then I have a function increment age, which takes a person and returns a person. This is amazing. This is probably my, my favorite thing uh, about Elm. It's clearer code because you're not typing it as it takes an object and returns an object. You're typing it as it takes my domain-specific object, in this case a person, which makes it really clear to understand. The compiler can check that you're not passing in records that have missing keys that it's expecting or extra keys that it's not expecting. And generally, this, all this stuff leads to no more undefined is not a function uh, and so on. I just want to touch upon uh, one thing you might have noticed in the previous slide. We are of the uh, leading commas club in Elmland. Uh, it's not quite spaces v tabs, not yet. I hope people get that reference. Uh, it was 50-50 if I put that in or not. Um, but we do go for the uh, leading commas style. What you'll see in a bit is there's actually a program called Elm Format, which is recommended. And what that will do is whenever you save your file in your editor, it will just run Elm Format on it and format the code for you. This is actually really nice, because regardless if you like this or don't like it, and I've, I, thought, I never thought I'd say this, but I've grown to quite like it. Um, Elm Format will just format it how the community expects code to be formatted. So it's just a non, it's not even a discussion uh, in Elm Land. In Elm Land, sorry. Although people still have it because it's the internet. Um, Elm is also really robust. Uh, as we've seen, the compiler errors really help with this, but also everything in Elm is immutable. There's no, there's no concept of mutability in the language. In JavaScript, uh, I think we've probably all come across this, this bug or a bug in a system because of this feature. Uh, if, you, if you pass an object into a function, that object is passed by reference, which means that the function in turn inside its body can edit that object, mutate it, delete keys, add keys, so on and so forth. And at this point, if I'm reading this code, I've no idea um, what's happened. If the person object has been mutated, is the function going to return a new person, or is it going to update the existing one I've given it? Uh, and then hashtag JavaScript. In Elm, though, this is impossible, because things can't be mutated. It's just a fact of life. In Elm, if I have a person, and we use let, by the way, to create what you can kind of think of as variables that exist only within the let in block. So I can create a person, which again has a name and an age, and then I can call increment age on that person. And I've got some guarantees now. I know that the person record is going to be untouched. Therefore, increment age must return a new person, else it can't give me the data that I want. And I know that I don't have to deal with mutation bugs anymore, and I can take the rest of the afternoon off. Honestly, the amount of times in, in whatever, an Ember, React, Angular, whatever it is app where I've been hit by a mutation bug because I've accidentally mutated uh, an object, 
it, it's happened so often to me um, that I'm just kind of done with it. Maybe I'm just rubbish at my job. Uh, Elm, just to quickly touch upon, also has modules. Uh, there's a few notes on these. They're not that exciting, really, other than everything is scoped. There's no kind of global scope going on. They have to explicitly declare what they expose, and they have to explicitly declare what they import. In these kind of terms, they're not a million miles away from uh, the ES2015 module spec or even the common JS, um, like Node-style modules. And another thing we have to do a lot in, in applications is deal with the possibility of nothing, a null or an undefined. I think, was it Tony Hawes who invented uh, nil or undefined or null, one of the three, I should have researched, um, called it his billion dollar mistake. He says it's, it was a dreadful idea. Uh, and it is a pain. How many times have you logged a value to see undefined or null? Uh, if there's any Ruby developers in the room, the whole like, you know, thing nil has no method, blah, uh, drives me up the wall. So Elm, um, there's no concept of nothing. You cannot have an undefined or a nil. There is an explicit concept um, called maybe. I'm not even joking, this is the literally built in. Um, so a maybe type uh, looks like this. This is built in, by the way, you don't have to define this, but I put the, uh, the definition here for you. A maybe type can be just a thing, or it can be nothing. So you, can, you go to a maybe and you say, are you a thing? And it goes, ah, I'm either just this thing, or I've got nothing uh, for you. Now this is weird, and this probably took me the most time to adjust to. But now I have, it's, it's, it's honestly, it's, it's amazing. It's so nice to work with, because what it makes me do is it makes me not be lazy. I think we've all written code where we've maybe fetched some data from an API or whatnot, um, or had like maybe a user's logged in or they're not, and we've only dealt with one case. We've assumed everything will work well, or we've forgotten the case where the user is logged out, or where this bit of data, we don't actually have it yet. Uh, because, well, that, you know, dealing with error cases and issues are way less fun than dealing with the great case where you have this data and you can do lots of cool stuff with it. Uh, Elm's going to make you way less lazy. Uh, you might see that as a good or bad thing. But it means we have to deal with data that might not be there. So say I've got, I've got this model, which is kind of all the data in my application, and it has a user property. That user property, the user will maybe be logged in, they might not be logged in. So we, we, we define it as a maybe user, where user is just a custom type I've also defined. Now in my view, though, I have to deal with it. So I switch, or I, I do a case on the model.user, and I see if it's nothing. If it's nothing, I render no user logged in. If it's just a user, so here I, de I destructure the just user pulls out that user from the, from the maybe, then I can, I can log out, logged in as user.name. So you must handle all cases of missing or pending data, because if you don't, the compiler will shout at you. So it's impossible not to deal with this. This is really uh, nice, and you will thank me, and you'll thank Elm for, for doing that. Elm also has a type called task, which we'll come back to later on and see it in context. But just to let you know, it does have a built-in module for dealing with asynchronous actions that might fail, brackets HTTP. When you create a task, uh, you create it with two also kind of additional types, if you like, or they're called like type tags. Uh, so here, this bottom one here, task string user, you read that as a task that will fail with a string or it will succeed with a user type. So think of this as if my task here is to you know, make an API request to log a user in, it will either fail with some string, maybe password invalid, or it will succeed with a type of user and give me back the user. Again, you, you have to deal with errors. You can't, you know, how many times have people written a promise, you know, and then fetch some data, dot then, and forgotten to put the dot catch on? Uh, I was stuck on a node bug for an hour the other night because I'd forgotten to catch uh, a promise, because apparently it's a good idea if rejections just get silenced. Um, but you have to deal with errors in Elm. You can't ever not be dealing with them. And if you do want to not deal with them, you at least have to write some code to explicitly not deal with them. You can't just forget about it. And then if you have to write that explicit code, you know that you're a dreadful person, and eventually you see better. And Elm also comes in with this idea of reactivity. That is that data changes a lot in, a, in an application. Things happen in the background, HTTP requests and so on. And it's got built-in uh, types for, for dealing with this. In Elm, we have commands and subscriptions. So again, we'll use these later on in an actual application. But commands are an asynchronous thing that Elm should run for you. So you, that's what we were talking about earlier. You give Elm a command, like fetch this data, it will go off and do it in the background. Then we have a subscription, or shortened to sub in the, in the code, which is a subscription to some data you care about that might change. This is if, you, if you've got some data and you want to know when it changes, you can subscribe to it. 
We won't actually use these. You often won't need uh, subscriptions in a, in a web application. So as I said, there is a load going on here, and this does take time to get used to. The syntax, the types, the immutability, the compiling point, the maybes, the error handlings, the tasks, the commands, the subscriptions. There's a lot of new concepts to learn, and I'm definitely not expecting everyone to just get it after this, uh, this half hour talk. Um, but I think there are a lot of benefits to, to learning some of this stuff. I think you will find it might be a little bit of a struggle immediately, but you'll get used to this idea and dealing with this, and you'll find yourself enjoying writing Elm. As I said, uh, if you do this, you are rewarded by the fact that we don't get runtime errors. And whilst Tim's in the corner debugging his Angular app, we're off at the pub. So if we go back to this kind of idea of the user clicking and actions happening, and then that calls the update function, which calls a view, which renders our new HTML, and so on, uh, one of the things that Elm makes very explicit is something called the Elm architecture. And this, is, um, this was initially released as a kind of side project alongside Elm. But this idea became so popular that it's now, with the latest version of Elm, moved into the uh, core, core package. And this is how we structure applications in Elm land. And I think this is probably the bit, if you're not into Elm and you don't want to start writing Elm, this is the bit that hopefully will, will be of most interest to you. Although I hope all of the ideas are, are interesting, else I've done a dreadful job. So in Elm, we have three parts to this, this architecture. We have a model, which um, returns a type model, which is all the data in our application. We have a view function, which can take a model and return some HTML. Don't worry too much about the, the types at this point. Then we have an update function, which takes a message and a model and returns our new model. To demonstrate this with the, the hello world of an Elm architecture application uh, is a counter application. So this is a, where we have a number and we can click a button to increment it and decrement it. Uh, and about 20 minutes ago, when I saw Tim was doing some live coding, um, I thought I should as well. So we're going to attempt to do this live on stage. Uh, I literally have no code written. Uh, we'll start it from scratch and hopefully give you a sense of what it's like to, to write some Elm. Uh, I've got backup slides if this all goes horribly wrong. So, right. OK. The first thing I'm going to do is mirror. Just talk amongst yourselves. Ah, look at that. OK. Let's go in here. Probably need this a little bit bigger. Is that readable for most people? Yeah, great. I would say wave if you uh, can't, but you probably can't see me. So, uh, so I'm in a completely empty folder. I have absolutely nothing going on here, and I want to build my Elm application. Uh, so something I haven't touched upon yet is all the ecosystem around Elm, and we'll revisit this later. But Elm comes with some command line tools to, to get you up to speed. The first one is called Elm Package. So to start a new Elm app, I just run Elm Package Install, come on the Wi-Fi. So it's going to install the core of Elm for me and ask if I approve. I do approve. You'll find it's quite a British um, package system, although the creator isn't actually British, but I reckon some of the contributors must be. Yes, I approve. Package is, has been configured, so we've installed Elm. There's also one other package we need, which is called Elm HTML, which will help us with rendering uh, HTML. So again, I'll do Elm package install uh, Elm lang dash HTML. May I add that to Elm package.json for you? Why, yes, you may. Thank you very much. It's very kind. Why, yes, I do approve of this plan, Elm package. So it's going to download H, uh, Elm Lang HTML. You see also that um, you might just be able to make out it says Elm Lang Virtual DOM. Elm under the hood uses a virtual DOM library akin to, to like the React of the world um, to keep this uh, nice and quick. Uh, Elm package doesn't quite make you a cup of tea, but it does do most other British things, uh, so we'll have to deal with that for now. So uh, I'll open up my editor. Like all good speakers who do live coding, I use Vim. Uh, and we'll create a file called app.elm. There's a kind of convention in Elm world that our Elm files are named with a capital letter. So app.elm. Uh, I then define a module called app. Uh, the module here maps the file name. Uh, and then I have, say, exposing, and I'm just going to do dot, dot. This, uh, this declares a module called app. Every Elm file has to have this declaration at the top where the module name matches the file name. The exposing dot, dot means every function in this, in this module uh, can be imported by another module. Usually, I would be more strict and only list in the exposing, in the parentheses, the actual functions I wanted to export. But for the purposes of demonstration, I'll, uh, I'll leave it alone. Uh, we also need a couple of other things that I'm going to import. So we need Elm HTML, and I'm going to expose uh, everything. 
I won't go into too much detail on this. Please come and grab me afterwards if you want me to step through this a bit more. Uh, and then I'm also going to import HTML.app, which is that kind of Elm architecture program we need. And then I need HTML.events exposing uh, on click, because in this case, I want to listen out to a click event. OK, let me just tidy these up a bit. So the first thing I'm going to want to do when you start running an Elm app is to define your initial model. So we're going to do that with a type alias. So I'm going to say type alias model. And in my case, I'm just going to alias it to be an int. Rather than have an object with all my uh, data in, because I've only got one bit of data, which is a number, I'll just model my, model my model as an int. Uh, notice as well that I've got Elm format running. So when I hit save, uh, it reformats the code for me into whatever is considered Elmy, which is also a scientific uh, term. Uh, OK, so then we need to define my initial model, what the starting value should be. So I say initial model is a function that will return a model. And then initial model equals 0. And again, you'll see that will be formatted for me uh, as well. So once I've got my model, I then want to decide what messages I can receive. So these are the user actions. In my case, it's going to be two. So I say type is increment, increment, or decrement, like so. And you can see it formats that for me too. The only issue with this is Elm tends to be quite long, and I've zoomed in a lot. So this could be a bit tricky, but usually there is a bit more room on the, the screen for all this stuff. Then I need to define my update function. So we know that my update function is going to take a message, and it will take a model model, and it will return a new model. So I say update message model equals. So then I need to, I need to match on what the type of message is and deal with my uh, data accordingly. So case message of. And then I want to say, right, when it's increment, I want you to return the model plus one. And then when it's, whoops, when it's decrement, I want you to turn the model minus one. And I hit save, and Elm, will do the re Elm format does the rest. Uh, and we have our update function. And then we need to find our view function. So this is going to take uh, a model and return HTML of type message. The additional message type here, by the way, means that this HTML can produce messages effectively from your, because we're going to allow the user to click, and that click will, innate, will create a, one of these messages. So I'll say view model equals. Uh, and then we go into um, Elm, HT, Elm Lang's HTML package has kind of, um, we define obviously our HTML in, in Elm. But it takes a bit of getting used to. So I won't go into this too much, um, but hopefully some of this makes sense. So uh, every HTML element that we create takes two arguments. The first is a list of all the attributes. The second is a list of uh, any child elements. So this one doesn't have any attributes, but it is going to have um, a button. And the button, when I click on it, I want to send decrement. And then in here, we'll just have the text minus. Then look at this ready, leading comma. Never thought I'd be doing that. Uh, we have a div with some text, and we just call to string on the model. So that will output the current value. And then we have another button that will do on click increment, and the text here will be, uh, whoops, will be plus. Then I close that out, whoops, like so. And there we go. So we've got our view now. Hopefully, um, that's fairly straightforward. And then we can uh, just hook everything up. So in Elm, to hook things up, we define a main function. Uh, I'm not actually going to bother with the type of this because it doesn't matter. Elm will look for this main function when you, run, when you run this Elm file and know that it should call it. So we call HTML.app. And then we have this method called beginner, beginner program, which is um, a, a variant of the Elm architecture built for simpler applications. There is a more complicated version that we'll see uh, in a bit, although I won't do that live coding because there's way more chance of me making a mistake. But when you're first getting started and you have more simpler Elm applications, this is all you need to get going. So what we do is we tell it what the initial model should be. Then we tell it uh, how it should update the view. And then I tell it what the update function is. And that's it. And then it will reformat that for me. OK, so that's it. That is our counter application. We can run it. Uh, da, da, da. So Elm also comes with a thing called Elm Reactor, which is just uh, it will chuck up a local host, and it will compile Elm for you um, through this. So if I go to localhost uh, 8000 and refresh, uh, we've now got this app.elm. I click it. It's going to compile and hopefully not error. <sighs> I'm disappointed that someone didn't spot that. Um, 
And of course, I need a space there because it's negative. So we go back and we refresh. Look at that, beautiful. Uh, and now we can click here and you see that goes down and that goes up. So that is uh, the, the kind of hello world of the Elm and the Elm architecture, the, uh, the counter. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not sure if it quite warranted all that applause, but I'll take it all the same. Uh, okay, so we don't need this slide. That's good. But anyway, the, um, the, the stuff I did is in the slides if you'd like to refer to it later. Uh, I should also mention that all the code is in a GitHub repo that I've got linked to later on. I'll tweet out and stuff with the hashtag so you can hunt all this down. Da, 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 da. So there's a few things I really like about writing applications using this style of architecture. The first is that we leave our view until last. That is to say we define the messages, the model, and the updates before we even touch the view. So we define all our data and all our business logic without even worrying about how the user interface will work. I really like that. I like decoupling it as much as possible. I like that you've got the user interface over here. You've got all the business logic and data over here. Notice how easy, so all our business logic lives in this update function. This would be trivial to test because it doesn't need any user interface. Gone are the days of like checking that when I click a button, it actually does something which renders something. I can just call the update function with the message I want. So just to give you a taste of uh, more complicated apps, I want to look at an app that will use a Elm command. So whenever you want to perform some work in the background, most commonly an HTTP request, you have to give Elm a command. Elm will go off, perform it, and call the update function with a new message when it's uh, done. So let's look at fetching someone's uh, GitHub data. Uh, I should have used Tim's username here, but I haven't. I have used my own. Um, so firstly, again, we'll start with the same steps as we always have done. We'll define our model. So I've got a type alias called GitHub person, which will have two fields, name and company. And these are just pulled from the GitHub API. I'll then alias my model. So I'll have a username, which is the current username we should look up. And I'll have a GitHub person, which is maybe a GitHub person, like, eh, maybe. Um, because we don't know, at the beginning, we're not going to have it, and we don't know whether the request will succeed or not. Then I'll define my messages. So things that can happen in this system, we can have new GitHub data. That is the HTTP request getting data back to us. And if so, that will give us back a, a type, an object, or sorry, a record of type GitHub person. We can have fetch GitHub data, which is like the user clicking a button that says go, start fetching data. And we need to deal with errors as well. So we can also have a fetch error, which is, um, also comes with an HTTP error that we can display if we want to. Uh, then we need to find our update. There's a couple of things going on here. Notice that the update function now is returning a model and then a command, just like we saw right at the beginning. Uh, I've, I've skipped out the code for dealing with the error just to save space on the slides, but I do deal with it in an actual app. Uh, and in the case that we have a new GitHub data message with a person, I'll take my model and I'll update the GitHub person key in it to be just a person. Because it's a type maybe, I can't just save the person line, it needs to be just a person. Uh, and then we don't need a command, so we return command.none, which basically tells Elm, don't do anything, just chill. Then we'll have fetch GitHub data, which is when the user clicks the button. That doesn't change the model, the model stays as is but we, we return fetch GitHub data with the model.username. And fetch GitHub data will return a command, and then we'll say, oh, I've got some stuff to do, and it will go off and run it. For, finally, we def or sorry, fourthly, define the view. So notice again that I have to deal with the user not being there. Uh, and then fifthly, we'll define um, what's called an init. And this is a function to set up your initial state. So I define my initial model. So I'll say the username that you should look up is Jack Franklin, but the GitHub person is nothing. We don't have one. Then I have an init function, which defines the initial model and also the initial commands. So I'll say the init function should give us that initial model and no commands, don't do anything. This is really useful if you want to make an HTTP request the moment your application starts up. So if I wanted to load my GitHub data the moment the user came to my website, I could pass in the command here. Finally, we hook it all together. So we use uh, html.app.program now because uh, we've gone past beginner program. So we give it init, view, and update. Uh, we also have this subscriptions uh, property. And this is a function that should return a list of subscriptions, which are bits of data we want to listen to. These are things like uh, the dimensions of the browser, uh, any external kind of inputs that are coming from JavaScript. Uh, we don't need any, so we just say sub.num, which basically means I don't need any. Don't listen to any subscriptions. 
I'm not going to cover it in the talk, by the way, but Elm has really good interoperability with JavaScript. So if you've got an existing JavaScript thing that you need to send data into your Elm thing, that's entirely possible. Before that might overload you a, a little bit for 10.35 uh, in the morning. But once we wire this all together, uh, I can click load, and we do get uh, Jack Franklin Pusher. And that is coming back uh, from GitHub. And as I said, this application is also um, on the actual GitHub repo as well, so you can run this locally. Now, something that a lot of people say at this point is that feels like a lot of code. And it does. We did have to write a reasonable amount of code to, to get to that state. Uh, there's also a bit of code that I haven't even shown you yet that we needed there, the actual fetching of the GitHub person. So there is a fair amount of code going on. And this, again, comes back to the kind of boiler, what is boilerplate, what is explicit, and what is magic argument that all these frameworks are kind of deciding to figure out where you, where you draw the line. I would argue that most of what I write in Elm, I consider kind of explicitness, which I like. There's not too much that I consider boilerplate. There is a little, and I think going forward, as more people build bigger apps in Elm, I think we'll find ways to reduce some of the boilerplate. The language will grow to, to suit that. But for now, I think most of Elm is, is good, and it's good to be explicit. Also, if, as you, you know, we did write a fair amount of code, but we're now in a position where if we needed a little new feature, we wouldn't have to write that much to add it. So there is a bit of kind of setting up your application at the beginning. As your app grows, I think the benefits of all these kind of explicit messages um, become way more kind of appealing to you. Would I recommend Elm for a little tiny application that loads a GitHub person? Probably not in reality, because it would just be overkill. Would I recommend it for a bigger app that loads in different GitHub API stuff and maybe lets you browse them? Quite possibly. So I just wanted to touch upon um, fetching data and how we deal with APIs, because that's a lot of what we do as, as JavaScript developers. Uh, Elm has this unique kind of problem, if you like, in that the data coming back from JSON, it needs to be able to convert into an Elm type that it can understand. So in Elm, you have to explicitly declare what you're expecting back from an API so that Elm can take the JSON and turn it into Elm objects. This, again, seems like a bit of a pain at first and takes a while to get used to, but it's suddenly really nice because you're suddenly defining everything you expect back from an API. If something goes wrong during one of these uh, as well, you'll get like an HTTP error. Or you'll get an explicit error to, to deal with. So I define my GitHub decoder. Uh, I won't go too much into JSON decoding, but basically I'm telling it here that this, this thing is going to be called later on with the raw data that comes back from GitHub. I'm telling it that it should turn it into a JSON object with two properties. It will be a type GitHub person, and it should look for a name and a company string, which are both equal to JSON.strings. So again, it's all about being explicit. I explicitly say what this API should give me and what it should do with the data. To make the request, I perform this line, which looks like complete gobbledygook. But we call HTTP.get, which is the uh, Elm HTTP module. I give it the GitHub decoder, so I tell it how to, to take the data and turn it into a, an Elm record. Uh, API URL username just gives me back the GitHub use, uh, URL, so that's a string. Then I pass that into task.perform, which we saw very, very briefly earlier. A task.perform will, will perform our task in the background and uh, give us back a command that Elm can, can deal with. Uh, so just to touch upon, just to get you a bit more uh, into types, this is the type definition of HTTP.get. That is pretty small, uh, I appreciate. But it takes a decoder for dealing with the JSON, it takes a string, which is the URL. It gives us back a task that will either fail with an HTTP.error type, or it will succeed with a type A. And notice that the type of the decoder, A, matches the, the task. So if a task will succeed, it will succeed successfully with a, decoder, with a decoded JSON result, or it will fail with an HTTP error. So again, errors are dealt with. Um, you can't not deal with them. So task.perform uh, takes a task that will fail or succeed. It will take an error function that can convert the failure to a message type, because all we care about at the moment is getting those messages. Those are the things that go through our update function that cause stuff to happen. It takes a success function, does the same. It returns a command that M will perform in the background for us. I appreciate that's quite a lot of code. Uh, it is all on this GitHub URL. I've actually got a shorter link later on in the slides. I should have deleted this one. So don't write this long one down. There's a short one later on. Or just head to my GitHub, and you'll find the, the repo there as well. And Elm also is, is pretty good at, at scaling your application, because all you do is you take this Elm architecture pattern, and you just repeat it all the way down, nesting it as far as you need to go to build out these components. 
I would say this is a little bit where Elm does suffer from boilerplate. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to stand here and say Elm is the be all and end all and it's the greatest thing ever to exist. It's close, but it's not quite there. Um, but one of the things where it does suffer is as you nest these components, you'll find yourself writing a decent amount of boilerplate to, to wire everything up correctly. And I'm hopeful as we move forward, we can start to reduce some of that, both with native language improvements and also third party libraries that will kind of take some of that away from us. Uh, so I just want to briefly touch upon the Elm ecosystem, which we got a taste of when we uh, did the installing of the packages. Uh, there's Elm Reactor. When you install Elm, you get this Elm Reactor command. It fires up the browser locally, as we saw, and compiles your code for you. This is great. You don't have to get any tooling set up to, to run Elm or compile Elm. You just use Elm Reactor. Now, we've already seen Elm package and how British it is and how much I like it because of it. But it also has a really, really cool thing. So who's been bitten by an NPM module being published with a new version, a semantic version, that doesn't actually match what it should have been? I think underscore published like a minor when it should have been a major version, so on and so forth. This happens fairly frequently. There's one poor man in the middle with his hand up uh, looking for sympathy, which I totally, uh, you, you have my sympathy. Um, so in, in, you know, in JavaScript land, packages don't have to be semantically versions. They, they should be, and most people do. But A, people make mistakes, and B, um, People are annoying. Uh, and sometimes you, you will install what you think is a minor version of a package, but it's not. It's actually a, a major one. This cannot happen in Elm. You cannot break Semver semantic versioning in Elm. Because everything is typed, Elm package can actually look through your application before you publish it and tell you if you've changed what you've changed and therefore what the version should be. So to give you an example of this, so I have a little practice a package called Elm Staty, which is a tiny state machine library uh, in Elm. So say I've made a change, I'm about to publish it, I can run Elm package diff, and it will tell me, um, compared to the published version, what's changed. And you see here, I changed the type of a function from, um, it doesn't matter what the types are, I changed the types. So it tells me this is a major change. So I should publish this as version 3.0, not 2.1. What's more, um, if I actually try to run Elm package publish, and gave it like 2.1, where it should be 3.0, it wouldn't let me. Elm will tell me that I'm doing it wrong. So you can never have a non-semantically versioned package in the Elm ecosystem. It just doesn't, it can't happen, which is kind of cool. Um, and, and really nice to work with it. It's great as an author as well, because I am guilty of making the mistake of publishing a package and messing up the version number. It just can't happen. Elm package, by the way, will also do a bunch of stuff like documentation for Elm modules are automatically generated based on the code you push up, but you have to format it, format comments in a certain way to act as documentation. Elm package will ensure that every function you expose that your user could use is documented. So you can never find a non-documented uh, package on the Elm package website because Elm package gets you to, to document them. And finally, as we saw, there's, there's Elm format. This isn't part of the Elm core, but it's kind of a community-run project on the side. I just really like the idea that we don't have to have the argument or set up an ESLint or JSHint or whatever it is these days to configure our, how our code looks. I like the idea that we just all install the same command line tool and all our code looks the same. This means when you go to any Elm repository on GitHub, the formatting is the same. You don't have to figure out how they formatted it or you know, work to their conventions. Elm format has, has got you. So if you do start running Elm, I definitely recommend checking that out. And of course, there's so much more I haven't covered. Elm is, is uh, pretty vast. There's loads going on in the ecosystem and in the core language that I haven't really touched upon. Um, and I, I couldn't fit it all in, but feel free to, to come and chat to me afterwards. So just to finish off, why or when should you use Elm? So you're fed up of debugging undefined function errors that take up loads of time. You're fed up of packages on NPM that break semantic versioning. Uh, you want to develop with the confidence and types and a clever compiler to back you up. As an aside, I find myself in Elm writing way fewer tests than I would in JavaScript because I trust that the compiler's got my back for, for so many cases. But there are some downsides. Um, you have to be happy to ride the wave, as it were, and deal with a language that's still growing, still changing, still settling down. You're happy to build more packages than depend on existing solutions. If you say you build an Angular app, you'll probably find 5,000 pre-made Angular components for you on, uh, on NPM. Elm is getting better as it, as it is around and more people use it, but it's not quite at the same level. You can't just reach out for every component and have it built for you. Sometimes you are going to have to build it yourself. But if you're willing to do that, I think you'll have a really nice time working with Elm. Would I recommend building your production-ready application in Elm right now? 
No, probably not. Would I recommend building a smaller internal app that you're, you're building for whatever reason? Yeah, maybe I would, because it would be a nice way to, to play with Elm, and hopefully some of the ideas can, can fall through into your JavaScript as well. But what if this talk has put me off Elm? Um, hopefully, that's not because of me. But Elm does take time to learn. Don't give up after, like, 30, I said 30, 45, sorry, minutes of slides. Uh, guide.elmlang.org is like a full tutorial, almost book type thing, which is a really good starting point. It will guide you through the syntax, then the Elm architecture, and so on. If you are interested, that is definitely the, the best reference. And as I said, Elm the language brings many concepts that are language agnostic. Things like the Elm architecture, I think, is a really interesting way to structure your application. Favoring explicitness across your application generally. And kind of what where you draw the line between explicitness and magic. Types. Uh, Tim's done, again, all my job for me. At this point, I was going to suggest TypeScript if you're not kind of ready to make such a big leap to Elm. Um, but we've already seen that, so obviously I'd recommend checking that out as well. And just generally, staying immutable, functional programming, I think, makes code nicer to work with. There's a load of libraries in JavaScript that adds uh, immutability, like immutable JS, Mori, JS. There's, there's lots of them. Maybe consider using one of those if you're fed up with being stuck with mutation bugs. And finally, I really like the process that Elm makes you uh, go through when you're building your application, the way you define your model first, you define your actions, you define the update, you define your view, and you just repeat that over and over again. This way of thinking I found really nice to work with. I like being able to separate the UI from the actual logic, and I like not having to deal with the UI until I've got all the, the logic down. Will everyone be writing Elm in, in 1, 2, 5, 10, 15, 20 years? Who knows? I don't know um, what the future of Elm holds. I'd like to think some people somewhere will be writing Elm, and it's, it's certainly not one of these things that will just suddenly die out. A lot of companies are investing in it more. Um, but you know, it's impossible to predict what will happen next week, let alone in, in two years. So I'm not going to be too bold and say that everyone will be using Elm. And also, Elm can learn from the ideas of other language. But either way, um, the game is most definitely on uh, when it comes uh, to Elm. Um, so I'll put these slides online, so please don't rush to write down these, uh, these links, because I'll, I'll tweet the slides once I've sat down. Um, that top one is just a redirect that will take you to GitHub. Turns out it's not much shorter than the GitHub URL, but I thought it would be nice. Um, JavaScriptPlaying.com, Elm, it's a bit easier to type, I guess, maybe, I don't know. As I said, guide.elmlang.org. Uh, elmlang.org slash docs is kind of the actual like, API documentation. If you want to get a bit more involved in the community, um, there's a Slack channel, there's a subreddit, which is like Reddit. Um, there's yeah, Slack, there's Reddit, there's an Elm Discuss mailing list, which is pretty good. If you really want to get involved, there's an Elm Dev mailing list um, where people say things that I don't understand. But you can find all that information at elmlang uh, slash community. The, the Slack channel is really welcoming. It's very, very friendly. Trust me, I've asked more stupid questions on there than anyone else. Uh, it's really nice. So if you do start playing with it, you hit a bug, feel free to drop into the Slack channel, uh, and there'll always be someone around to, to ask about it. All right, that's been me. I'm Jack Franklin on Twitter. I blog at JavaScriptPlaying.com. Uh, thank you very much for listening.